In 2011, Japan had one of its worst earthquakes on record. It led to a tsunami which devastated the country and led to the single largest nuclear disaster of the 21st century. Today, I discuss the facts of what led to this incident, as well as the misinformation campaign that convinced many nations to move away from nuclear power. I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic. Hello again and welcome to Rock Logic. I'm your host Sean Kenny, and before we get started, I wanted to ask you to hit the like button, drop a comment below, and help us get the word out to other interested viewers like you by appeasing to the great and powerful YouTube algorithm. 2021 marked the 10-year anniversary of the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, an undersea quake that led to a tsunami which caused significant damage to eastern Japan. Over 15,000 people lost their lives, 228,000 lost their homes or were permanently displaced, 6,000 were seriously injured, and another 2,500 of Japan's citizens are still unaccounted for and considered missing to this day. In addition, the World Bank estimates that the disaster cost Japan over $235 billion in damages, as well as a half a percentage point of their country's GDP the following year. Murphy's Law came out in full force in that everything that could go wrong with pressurized water reactors did. The resulting fallout led to public mistrust in conventional designs and led to many countries reevaluating their energy policies in regards to nuclear power. Some countries, like Germany, made a concerted effort to shut down the reactors as they doubled down on coal and intermittent renewables. Could this have been avoided? Before I get into what went wrong, I'm going to give those of you who are new to the channel, or nuclear power in general, a brief refresher on how a conventional nuclear power reactor works. You have a typical light water reactor, which contains solid uranium fuel rods surrounded in a zircodium cladding. It is surrounded by water, which acts as both the moderator and heat transfer medium. The water is pressurized to allow it to be heated above traditional boiling temperatures. The steam spins a turbine to generate power. To prevent a meltdown of the fuel, the control rods are pulled out to stop fission and backup generators pump cold water into the reactor. If there is a complete loss of power to the site, the reactor is surrounded by a 9 inch thick steel pressure vessel, which in turn is surrounded by a dome comprised of steel reinforced concrete. This is to prevent radiated steam from escaping the reactor. These are engineered safety systems in place to help prevent a complete nuclear catastrophe. So with all these systems in place, why did things get so out of hand here? The Fukushima Daiichi plant was comprised of six pressurized water reactors. On the day of the incident, reactors 4, 5, and 6 were shut down to accommodate refueling, while reactors 1, 2, and 3 were fully operational. When seismic sensors picked up the foreshock of the 9.0 earthquake that would devastate Japan, the reactors were taken offline and the backup generators proceeded to pump cold water into the reactor to offset decay heat. Less than an hour after the quake, a tsunami 46 feet high came in thrashing the coastline of eastern Japan. That same wave pushed through the safety barriers and washed away all 16 backup power generators on site. This presented a major problem because aside from some battery backup systems that were on site, there was no way to keep those reactors cool enough to prevent a meltdown. TEPCO, the main utility company responsible for the reactor, tried to get backup power delivered on site. However, with all the major roads destroyed by the quake and the following tsunami, they just couldn't get there in time. As decay heat continued to persist, the water in the reactor proceeded to boil off into steam. The steam reacted badly with the circodium cladding, causing it to oxidize, and this oxygenation led to a buildup of hydrogen gas. Eventually, the buildup led to a hydrogen gas explosion that blew the roof off of all three reactors and led radioactive debris to escape. Eventually, reactors 1 through 3 suffered severe core meltdowns, which caused irreparable damage to the site. The resulting fallout led to various radioactive materials to escape, such as cesium-137. When this happened, the Japanese government widened the evacuation area and over 154,000 people were forced to leave their homes and were placed in temporary housing. Now, this sounds really bad, and by all accounts, it was. I'm not overstating things by saying this was one of the worst nuclear disasters in recent history. If someone went through this disaster and came out of it alive, I would not blame a person for taking an anti-nuke stance. But here's the thing. In spite of the amount of damage that occurred at Fukushima, only one person died as a direct result of radiation exposure. 16 were injured due to the hydrogen gas explosions, and another two were sent to the hospital with radiation burns. 
The fact is that more people died from the resulting evacuation than from the actual disaster itself. Was there radiation leakage? Yes. However, radiation had dissipated to levels similar to what one would get from a chest x-ray. Yet, in spite of the facts that I just presented, many around the world were fearful of nuclear power, to the point where several Western nations made plans to shut down reactors prematurely. Why is that? If you watch this channel a lot, you know I don't have a particularly high opinion of cable news networks. Whether you have a right-leaning or left-leaning bias, it doesn't matter. The major news organizations, particularly in the United States, do not do a good job of disseminating information to the public. And the reason behind it is very sad. For the last decade, many people have cut the cord to cable TV and have decided to get their media from cheaper online streaming platforms. This has caused issues with many cable news networks, seeing as their revenue streams are directly tied to ratings and the ability to deliver consumers to advertisers. With fewer viewers watching their content, several cable companies started having serious financial issues, leading to desperate attempts to regain the lost audience. In the event of a major disaster, especially one involving a nuclear power plant, the media pops up and presents nonstop coverage of the disaster. If you were around during the event, you remember CNN showing the explosion, MSNBC covering the damage of the resulting towns, and nonstop fear and hysteria involving the radiation exposure by showing scary maps and saying there were radiation clouds coming to kill you. Of course, it was only a month after the initial incident that admissions of guilt came forward. The damage to the surrounding towns was caused by the earthquake and tsunami. The radiation leak was a thing, but as stated previously, the effects were minuscule as the fallout blew further and further out. The NRC stated as much, indicating that the initial concerns from the hydrogen gas explosion were greatly exaggerated. But by that point, the damage was already done. Mainstream outlets use fear and radiation to scare people into watching the news because as ratings go up, the networks can charge more to advertisers to sell you on antidepressants and sleep aid medication. I'm not coming down hard on everyone here. I know that there are good people who work in these institutions. And while I can't blame people for trying to earn a living, the fact of the matter is that there are moral implications here. Yes, Fukushima was bad, but when put in perspective, it doesn't come close to the deaths associated with fossil fuels. Yet, people hear radiation and they run for the hills. While news agencies profit from that fear, policymakers respond to said fear and make concerted regulatory efforts to slow, if not halt, the progress of nuclear power expansion. We saw this come into play after Three Mile Island. America's regulators in the United States stopped granting licenses to build new plants for 30 years. After Chernobyl, we saw then-Senator John Kerry push the Democrats into an anti-nuclear stance, which led to the shutdown of the integral fast reactor experiments, even though these experiments were successful in demonstrating the safety aspects of their designs. Just to be clear, I did not do this episode to be a champion for light water reactors. Many of you know that I have gone into great detail about why this design is inherently flawed. And yes, TEPCO made a lot of mistakes leading up to Fukushima, but there are designs with inherent safety benefits that are far superior to what we have now. If a molten salt reactor was running at the Fukushima plant, we would be talking about the earthquake, not the power plant. We can't forget what happened that dreadful day, but we can't let fear rule our lives either. The sooner we adopt these advanced designs to our grids, the brighter our future will become. As always, I leave with a pledge that as progress continues to be made on this front, I will continue to deliver the word. For now, I'm Sean Kenny, and this was Rock Logic.